Hey, it's Chuck. Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball. Now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is Ryan Day has made a change philosophically. But it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. Start. <laughs> and welcome in. Thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Appreciate you so much, as always. And we had ourselves another big day as we got uh, commit number 20 in the, the class. Well, we're calling it V25. That's what they're calling it officially. V25, commitment number 20, Brody Lennon, tight end from Gates Mills, Ohio, Gilmore Academy, a very, very fancy place. Uh, unfortunately, that means he plays in a very small conference with a lot of football players who absolutely cannot hang with an Ohio State caliber football player. So because of that, he's very underrated. But he is uh, an excellent football player. At 6'4", 220, down at Ohio State's camp, he ran a 4'5", 2". Uh, the dude is lightning fast for his size, and he's probably going to be about 6'4", 245, uh, super versatile. When you watch him play defense, it looks like this guy could be, I don't know, I, I just got the feeling if he went to a bigger school, he would have been one of these stud linebackers like uh, like a Gabe Powers coming out of Ohio, it's just it's just a feel I get from him. Super fast man, super fast, super nasty. Loves football. I think he's going to be a great tight end, and he's extremely confident, um, borderline cocky, which I love. Here's what he had to say: Excited to work with Chip Kelly. Who wouldn't be Brody? Chip came from the Eagles, and a while ago, Zach Ertz was the highest receiving tight end in the NFL. So that's kind of the direction they want to use me in. Clearly, they use that recruiting pitch, and I absolutely love that. Use that. Uh, some people are anti using a lot of the tight end, and I am uh, all for it. I think that the best development we've seen in a while was last year, getting the tight end more involved. It just feels like we've been beaten so many times by weaker teams because they've exploited us with a tight end. Easy pickings all the time. It's always there. Get me some nasty tight ends and let's use some more tight end. So I'm great with it. I absolutely love Nate Roberts. Uh, Brody also said, they're just going to use the best players that are on the field. So if that's the tight end, it's going to be the tight end. And I think they're going to head in the right direction and start using a lot more 12 personnel because there's just so much more talent in that room, especially with me and Nate coming in. It just helps so much more. So they're going to use the best players on the field. I think they're heading in the right direction using more 12 personnel, which is two tight ends. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be condescending. Just if you didn't know, that means two tight ends on the field at the same time, especially with me and Nate coming in. So he clearly views himself as a talented kid. Um, obviously, you want talented kids and you want confident kids. He's very confident. And I think there's a lot of folks who might have thought that he was just maybe, uh, I don't know just kind of a toss in or uh you know local ohio guy getting an offer this dude's legit we've watched his film here three or four times honestly uh we watch a lot of film here for a little minute at a time i brought this dude up a lot throughout this cycle back when uh it was Brock shot luca gilbert and brody lennon were were the options to be that second tight end in the class Brock shot and luca gilbert went off the board within two days of each other down to Miami and Brody Lennon was the only one left, but it didn't look like Keenan Bailey was interested. Uh, comes down to camp, boom, earns his offer. Now he's in the class. I love it. And I love that we are now at 20 guys in this class and we still got about seven or eight more dudes to go because normally we're wrapping things up. This is just about it. We're, we'd be about done now. Um, and that's really exciting. Let's have a look at the board and see where the needs are. But when you look at it, I mean, it is it is a really nicely rounded roster with one quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, two offensive linemen, two tight ends on defense, two corners, three safeties, three defensive ends, two linebackers, 
So obviously we're missing a couple more offensive linemen and the interior defensive linemen. Who's next to commit? Trajan Odom commits at noon today. Noon today and at 1140, I'm going to fire this puppy up and we're going to watch that together live. So if you want to come here, I'm not doing a show. I'm not doing a segment. I mean, maybe I'll do a segment if I see something in the morning I want to talk about. But I'm just going to pop this up and we're going to watch it. Because I think that Trajan Odom, every year there is a guy who is maybe just a little uh, a little underrated or who's not getting a whole lot of hype. And I think that Trajan Odom is that guy. I've been feeling some kind of way for Trajan Odom for quite a while, but I thought he was going to Oregon. So I haven't, uh, we got some Oregon listeners. I'll just be, be honest here. We got, we got some Oregon people who watch the show every day and I didn't want them to know how much I liked this guy. So I didn't talk much about him, but now I think that he's coming to Ohio state. I'm, I'm coming out of the closet for Trajan Odom. Totally. I love this dude. He's fantastic. He's big. He's long. He's aggressive. I think he's a real difference maker in the middle. I do. And, uh, you know, Maxwell Riley might also announce today that I think there's a chance of that. And that would be fantastic too. But Maxwell Riley, I think is more of, uh, um, eh, he's just not the same. I think Trajan Odom is, is that next level. And then Malik Autry would be that next level on top of that. But, uh, you know, settling for Trajan Odom, that would be one heck of a job for the guys. Because if you get Odom and you get Maxwell Roy, now you can kind of breathe easy and just take your big shots at Jakeem Stewart and Malik Autry. And uh, we're looking real good if we can get them. Uh, USC just lost. Guys, do you remember that day a couple, I mean, it was like two months ago, where within like three days, they got Elijah Griffin, Justice Terry. Those are the two five-star defensive linemen from Georgia. And I was talking about them, and then they went and got uh, they got that awesome, uh, I think it was a cornerback from Florida. Well, the two USC guys decommitted. Today, the Florida cornerback decommitted. So that big defensive haul they were putting together, uh, all gone now. They're all gone except for, the, except for Gus Cordova. That's the kid that uh, tried to poison the dude with the peanuts, that, that kid um, down in Texas that was on our board and then off our board after that. So that's the one they got left on defense uh, from that early little haul they had going. So that is a conf- that is a you know it's a Big Ten rival now. So we got to kind of monitor what they're doing too, and they're not they're not doing so good. But it also helps us with the Dorian Brew situation. They've now lost three huge defensive recruits, and their pitch to these guys is: come in here, we're going to get you all in here, and we're going to change this. And you're going to be the ones to do it. Uh, Dorian can't go there and do it on his own. But it's also somewhat scary because now they're really desperate. And they were just about to spend a bunch of money on Elijah Griffin and Justice Terry. And that money is now freed up. And if they lose everybody, all the big dogs they were after, Trey McNutt they were also big after, they want Dorian bad. And Dorian likes USC. They're coming really, really hard now. And uh, it could go one way or the other. It could be like, all right, the situation is way too bad. Like now there's nobody there. You know, I don't know, man. It's, It's a tough one. It could go one way or the other with Dorian Brew. But I think we all know that Dorian Brew wants to be at Ohio State. It's certainly every time we've seen him talk, uh, particularly the interview he did with Mark Givler of Buckeye Huddle. He was referring to Ohio State as we, just like we do. You know what I mean? Um, the dude's a Buckeye. The dude is a Buckeye, and uh, I still I still believe he's going to be a Buckeye. But let's talk about these tight ends. Now, Keenan Bailey obviously worked his way up to this role, and he is a guy who's not under the same kind of scrutiny as Justin Fry, but there's a lot of people who are skeptical on. I think most people are kind of reserving judgment. Listen, he crushed this recruiting class. There's no doubt about it. Um, all that matters is the results. I, I, you know, I, I was skeptical about the way he got to this, 
Uh, he really went all in on Nate Roberts. And if he didn't end up getting Nate, there might have been a situation. But he did, so it doesn't matter now. And then he got Brody, and I think it's a really great class for tight ends. But how about the guys he's got this year playing? I mean, I've heard from some of these uh, beat writers close to the team, close to the team, that G. Scott is essentially, you know, penciled in as the starter. And I don't like the feeling of that. I just don't. I feel like unless there was some big improvement from last year to this year, and there very well could be from G. Uh, I, I don't think he is a starting caliber tight end at Ohio State, which puts us in a bit of a pickle because we don't know if Will Kaczmarek is going to be there yet either, coming from OU, though I think he is probably the guy I would choose if it was my choice. Um, I just, uh, as much as I like G, don't get me wrong, I think he's a great Buckeye, great role model. Uh, I, I, I really, really like the man that he is. And I hope he makes captain. I'm rooting for him to be a captain of the team. But the starting tight end, I'm really not rooting for that so much, to be quite honest. I just, uh, just too many blocking errors. Uh, and uh, I didn't see it get better all year long. And I'm telling you what, these position coaches are the ones who decide who's playing what, how many reps. I, I want to see Jelani Thurman. I want to see accelerated development and an accelerated plan on Jelani Thurman. There's not Cade Stover in there taking taking the playing time now. There's no excuse when you've got a mediocre to poor tight end, which is what G. Scott was last year. You know, mediocre to maybe slight, slightly less than mediocre for Ohio State standards. There's no excuse not to be have a Jelani Thurman on an accelerated playing plan and getting him as many minutes as you can every week. I want to see it, man. I really want to see it. And then, remember, they did promise now they're going to be playing a lot more depth. Last year, and let's just say freshman, we're not even talking underclassmen, but freshman last year at Ohio State played 50% less snaps than their counterparts at Georgia. So this is something that under Ryan Day has been not very good. They've not been good at playing the younger guys. Uh, you know, we've always known it. But it really stands out when you hear a statistic like that, just how much, you know, just how many fewer snaps our guys were getting, our freshmen, than they were at a, at a place that has comparable talent, both comparable veteran talent and freshman talent. Um, so I'm really hoping they stick to the plan. I think that's something we're all hoping to see uh, because old habits die hard. And when you start to turtle up, you get a little scared about playing your young guys. Those guys need to get in there and learn with live reps. They just do. So that's my that's my thoughts on that. And Keenan Bailey, I'm reserving judgment. Um, I think this is a real. We're going to see a lot this season when we when it comes to Keenan Bailey. Keenan Bailey, I really think we're going to see a whole lot about him. And uh, did a heck of a job in this class. I love Brody Lennon. Now on the defensive board, we just talked about Dorian Brew. Um, Dorian Brew, it's thought to be down to USC and Ohio State. And we talked about the USC situation. I don't know when he's going to make his decision, but the noise is it's coming really soon. Brandon Finney, I don't know why he's still on there. He's gone. Now, we know McNutt just got his crystal ball from Justin Hopkins of Scoop Duck to Oregon. Riley Pettijohn saw some more movement today by a Texas insider, another one talking about he's hearing more Ohio State noise on Riley Pettijohn. Nothing's changed on Malik Autry, even though he did say you know he may have a, his decision uh, within the week, even though there's no decision to be made as he's committed. Trey Genotum is tomorrow. Maxwell Roy, we don't know. I'm sorry, Trey Genotum is today. Maxwell Roy might be today. Jarquez Carter, if we get Odom and we get Roy, uh, that's over with. Jarquez Carter... He's going to decide in the middle of the month, and uh, there won't be a spot for him, I don't believe. Jakeem Stewart, obviously, we know we're a long ways from that. Marion Dye, we've not heard much from at all. Same with Damian Shanklin. And Riley Pettijohn, that may be coming in early July, too. We don't know for sure yet.
All right, guys, we got to get to a question here that I was asked today, which was, um, I mean, it's just, there's been so much talk about Justin Fry. And I think this question here I got from Devin is something that we should talk about here. Oh, this is not Devin. Well, since I got this up, our buddy here says his ideal finish to finish off the class is going to be David Sanders and Javon McFadden with at least one more lineman, plus Jakeem Stewart and Malik Autry, after adding Roy and Odom, of course. He'll also have DeCorey and Moore or Jamie French. Give us Dorian Brew and Trey McNutt as well, and either Riley Pettijohn or Nathaniel Awasu Batang. That'll take us up to about 30. I can live with that. <laughs> that is one optimistic dude, my bud. I like it. I like it. All right, so here's Dev. Dev's question is, if we sign David Sanders, would that put Fry in our good graces as far as recruiting? His answer is no. This is the Ohio State University. We should never be in the position we are now with the 2025 class for offensive line. I don't think he has the recruiting chops to coach here, and his coaching is even questionable as of right now. All right, so the question is, is he in our good graces? If he lands Sanders, and the statement is we should never be in the position we are in now with the 2025 offensive line class, and the situation we are in is if you don't land David Sanders, there now is no way that, that I can see that, that you're going to be able to have a very good class, um, even an average class by a lousy uh, Ohio State line coaches standards. It, it's going to be less than average. You're going to get a great one in Carter Lowe, and then you're going to get, you know, and we're just talking recruiting rankings and such. There, there is no other avenue to get another four star at all. It's going to be, uh, you know, lower rated guys. And there's a couple ways to look at this, but because so many people are talking about the Fry Man. Um, I just started thinking about this question and it just kind of made me think like, all right, so in our fandom, because everybody watching this show during the off season, talking about coaches and classes, very tuned in people, but we weren't always this tuned in. It was a slow progression, but since you've been this tuned in, you remember looking back, all right, there was a time where then you went from this to, wow, all of a sudden I can name every every single coach, every position coach, it wasn't like that when you were a kid. There was a point that it got to that. But since it's been that, think back and think back of all the different coaching staffs. And it kind of seems like to me when I think back that there's always been one, sometimes more, but always at least one who seems to be the fan base's whipping boy. The one that we collectively hate. And I need to constantly try to remind myself not to get sucked in to like the pack mentality and try to jump on people if they don't deserve it. Now, the question here is, I fully admit that I have roasted this dude and I've been on his butt. Uh, the majority of my issue is with his strategy. And, that, and I, th I think it's just, uh, I just think it's insane. Okay, I think it's an insane strategy. I think it's insane to think that you know better than Georgia and Alabama how to recruit offensive linemen when you're coming from UCLA with no experience in this in this kind of water, right? That's my stance on his strategy. However, this is a results-oriented business. And if you end this class with David Sanders and this guy, Watch him one more again. Hey, hey, hey. Toss in the local hometown story with Jay Cook at center. Carter Lowe, who looks outstanding. Carter Lowe 
the number 33 ranked player in 247, which is one spot away from five star, got his whole senior year to play. I think he'll get that spot, which would have you looking at two five star linemen plus Jake Cook, plus maybe another Andrew Stargell or Javon McFadden. In a year that we came in to the cycle thinking they were only going to take three offensive linemen. If that is the end result, buddy, we got to be fair. Let's talk about how it's been. So how bad or good of a recruiter has he been? Let's just run it back one more time here. And when I say a four-star or a three-star, I always say the national rank because there's a ton of variance between a four-star like Carter Lowe, who's the 33rd ranked player in the nation, and Eli Owens at Michigan, who's also a four-star, but number 406 in the nation. Huge difference there. But an even bigger difference in the 408th prospect in the nation, who's a three-star, and the 1,252nd player in the nation, who's also a three-star. So whenever we can, we like to use those numbers. And just so we know, 32 five-stars and four-stars go down to about 400. So we're all on the same page here. But if we want to simplify it, and I want to do this today, just because we've been talking about the blue chip ratio this week, right? The blue chip ratio, the percentage of four and five stars you have on your team. We know that the team has a 90% blue chip ratio. So let's just get generic with it like that. What is Justin Fry's blue chip ratio with his players? His first cycle, he had a four man recruiting class Luke Montgomery and Josh Padilla, four stars. Austin Searvold, Miles Walker, three stars. His second cycle, four man class again. He had the twins, Devontae and Deontay Armstrong, three stars. Gabe Van Sickle, three star. And Ian Moore, four star. So far this class, we've got Carter Lowe, a three star. I'm sorry, a four star. And Jake Cook, a three star. So you got 10 total players that he's brought in. Hopefully, Carter Lowe and, and Jake Cook, everything makes it to the end. 10 total guys. That is four blue chips with a 40% blue chip ratio, and the rest of the team, 90%. Well, higher than 90% because you have to, you know, he's bringing it down. Now, a lot of people are going to say and, and have said, we've never recruited high on offensive line. We've never had a bunch of five stars on the offensive line. We've never had a bunch of five stars anywhere. You don't get a bunch of five stars. You, you know, you get two to three a class if you're really, really good. So, no, we've never recruited a bunch of five stars on the offensive line. Have we recruited a bunch of four stars? Certainly. Um, Greg Sedwara's last couple of classes have definitely looked better, definitely looked better than Justin Fry's first couple of classes. But when we say we've never done this or we've never done that, we've never done a lot of things that we're doing in recruiting now. The last 10 years in recruiting have just been consistently up and up and up as far as new things that we're doing and new things that we're getting better at. We look at areas that we're going into now that we have had no business going into, you know, 10 years ago. So every single position group is getting better and better and doing things that we've never done before um, or done sporadically on, on the regular, but not the offensive line. Now it wasn't doing it before Fry, right? So it's not like he's the only one that hasn't been raising it, but he hasn't he hasn't raised it up at all. And uh, that's something that we can't just keep accepting and saying, well, it's we, we have never done that, so it's just never going to be. I refuse to buy that at all, right? But that's not the question. The question is about David Sanders in this class. Do we give him some grace. Do we uh, let him off the hook, so to speak, uh, let him off the proverbial Buckeye fan hot seat because we've all turned our attention at this one guy. Well, what's our goal? Our goal is to have a very good offensive line. We don't really care how we get there, right? 
we've gotten there with just Ohio guys. Granted, we're talking, you know, guys that were four star guys, some three star guys. We know the options in the portal are limited, so you can't rely on that. Most of it's got to come from recruiting. Now, we came into this class again, believing we were only going to take three offensive linemen. That was the conventional wisdom. A lot of people are discrediting Sanders if we land him already. I, I, I hear it already. This is not a Justin Fry recruitment. This is an all-hands-on-deck recruitment. It's a Ryan Day recruitment. While there's some truth to that, if this was the number one defensive lineman and not an offensive lineman, and it was the entire, I mean, every all hands on deck recruitment. I don't think anybody would be saying that about Larry. We would just give Larry the, the W. And I think Justin deserves the W as well. If he gets the offensive lineman, it's his W. He gets it. And a class with Carter Lowe, David Sanders, Andrew Stargell, Jake Cook, or Jake Cook, Javon McFadden. Really, really good class. But the best part is next year's class. And next year's class has three guys in Ohio already with offers in Maxwell Riley, Sam Greer, Will Conroy. Really, really highly rated lineman in Ohio. Also got Adam Guthrie, also another highly rated lineman in Ohio, another four star, four four star guy. Well, one five star, three four stars. And I see Sam Greer continuing to shoot up the board. Also in on a lot of the big national guys so far to start off the class, as well as some of the guys that are four-star guys that we missed out on so many of them like this year's guys. Guys that we would kind of compare to guys like a Zaire Addison or a Henry Finuco. We're in on quite a few of those types from around the country. Champ Smith down in uh, Vero Beach, Tiro, uh, TJ Alford's buddy. Um, Darius Gray, who camped, he he's really high, and uh, they they offered him at camp. Uh, that uh, the big boy down in West Virginia. Um, so we got our hands in a lot of different cookie jars for the class of twenty twenty six, and I don't see any way this could possibly be screwed up. That if you land Sanders, you are going to stack two classes of excellent linemen on top of each other. So that being said, if he does land Sanders, yes, I absolutely think it would be 100% unfair of me. Um, and, you know, everybody's got to make this decision for themselves, but I feel like I would be being unfair if I didn't then back off of him with, with my criticism for sure. And, and it almost gets me excited thinking about it because not only does Sanders elevate this class, but to be able to stack that next class on top of the Sanders class that has Carter Lowe, who's because he committed so early, it's just kind of out of sight, out of mind. When I saw that clip, I was like, man, I forgot how good this dude is. Like, wow. Um, those are two fantastic linemen. In this class of 2026, when I rattled off those four Ohio guys, it's not just that they're four Ohio guys. It's two tackles, true tackles, one six seven, one six eight, and then two interior linemen, six four and six five. You got to lock them dudes down, man. You got to lock them down. I could care less, could not care less. I always get that one wrong. I really don't care if they get go after any of the big five-star names next year. Just get us the hometown boys, which is what I said from the beginning about our two running backs this year in Marquise Davis and Bo Jackson. And we went through all this big rigmarole, sorry, all this big rigmarole. Um, and it, we got two great ones with Bo and Isaiah. Um, we probably could have got Bo, Marquise and Isaiah, but you know, they had to go after Jordan Davison. You know, nobody listens to me. <laughs> I'm kidding, obviously. Um, 
but I'm getting excited about the offensive line. Bro, if we land Sanders, we're going to be looking great. We're going to be looking so great. If we don't, it's going to get so bad. Like I'm telling you, right? I, I get, I see so many comments disparaging about Fry, and you guys know, I don't like the dude. Okay, I resent the fact that Ryan Day hired his buddy. I don't like it, and here's why. I feel like it doesn't matter what he does. He's going to have to screw up so bad that it's going to hurt the team before Day pulls the plug on it. That's why, and that bothers me. It really, really bothers me. Um, of course I'm rooting for him, right? But man, that just, that irritates me when coaches do things like that, because we've seen things not be great with him and we know what good friends they are. People referring to them even as best friends before, you know, so it's like, okay, if this guy keeps screwing up, how, how long do we have to deal with it before you cut the cord? You know, that's why I can't stand it. I, I don't like coaches hiring a best friend. Um, a guy like Chip Kelly, who's established and fantastic, different ball game. Obviously, that's Ryan Day's friend, mentor. But uh, yeah, I just don't like it. So to answer your question, I, I definitely think that I would be a total hypocrite if I didn't give him uh, some grace if he landed Sanders. That's how I feel about it. Um, but I totally understand if 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 you don't, Deb. And I'm not just specifically speaking to you. I think that was a great topic to bring up. And that's why I wanted to, wanted to say it because I've had some people bust my chops for being too hard on fry. Um, and I, and I get where they're coming from too. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I think the root of it is more, not just what fry's done or not done, but the fact that day hired his good buddy and the fear that he may stick around through really bad times on the offensive line because he's his buddy. Um, so anyway, that's where we're at with that. You know what else? Regarding Andrew Stargell, um, he got a, somebody let me know in the comments today, he got a crystal ball to UCF. So Andrew Stargell, uh, again, we'll just reiterate this one more time. Jake Cook worked out at center. Fry offered him to be a center. Stargell was thought to be the center offer. And Jake is versatile enough and big enough to play guard. Stargell's not. Stargell's only 6'3", might still grow a little more. But Stargell's a center. Jake could play guard, but they don't want Jake as guard. They want Jake as a center, which would make you think, Stargell, they don't want him anymore. Well, Stargell gets a crystal ball to UCF today. Somebody lets me know. I didn't know that. I checked it. Yeah, sure enough, he's got a crystal ball to UCF. I reached out to him. Hey, you got this crystal ball to UCF. What's up? Where's that? He had no idea. Everything's good between him and Ohio State, according to him. And I'm just wondering... When are they going to let this dude know if they don't intend on taking him? Because it doesn't seem like he knows one bit if that's the case. Well, I mean, he doesn't know if that's the case. So are they still going to accept his commitment? Because the dude's had his date set for a month now. Or are they just going to wait till his commitment day and say, oh, no, we, sorry, bud, we forgot to tell you. We're, we're actually set at center, and, and uh, you're going to need to go ahead and pivot off of this one go somewhere else that would be pretty crappy that would be pretty crappy and i would not uh i mean it would be really crappy for justin fry if uh you're just treating people like that like that's not how you treat people if you're not going to take him let the dude know you know what i mean like let him know um there's always the possibility that he could not be letting me know that he was let know that and that he was embarrassed you know i can see that too but who knows? But everybody's talking about this stupid ranking of the toughest stadiums. Here's the deal. This is my kind of story. You know I love stadiums. You know I love helmets and uniforms. Like my, All these walls that you're not seeing, they're covered in flags. All college football flags and pennants. All of them. Like the whole place. 
And I don't even like the teams. I just love different stadiums, colors, logos. And this story comes out from EA Sports about ranking the toughest stadiums to play in. And I'm so excited to talk about it because it's my kind of slam. And then I see every single podcast in the world discuss this stupid list and just rip apart the list. And, and now it's like, I can't even talk about it because you've already seen it 20 times, but at the same time, I have a little different spin on it. So I want to talk about my spin because I think they've screwed up in the way they did this, but they still came to two of the three proper answers at the top of the list. So I did my episode on my favorite college football traditions, and very few of you watched that one, which hurt my feelings, but that's okay. I got over it, and there is a lot of stadium stuff in that episode, a lot of ones that are really hard to play in at certain periods. We talk about like the Penn State whiteout, Um, but that's just during the whiteout, not the same stadium. A lot of people took issue with Kyle Field being number one. On this particular list, they point to their home record uh, in the SEC. It's it's like barely over 500. Um, that's ridiculous to me. I don't think that has anything to do with what makes a tough a t- stadium tough to play or not. Not the results. What makes a stadium tough to play to me is does the environment of the stadium affect the outcome of the game more than your average stadium? So, what makes a stadium tough to play in? To me, you're talking about three main things. The architecture of the stadium. When we look at a stadium like the big house that's built in a way that all the noise just goes straight up, fans are spread out wide, like deep. The architecture of that place will never make it a tough place to play in. And you compare that to a place like Washington Husky Stadium, where it's stacked up, like straight up. Everything looks like it's made of tin. The noise just reverberates off it. But that's not the only thing. How close are the sidelines to the fans? There's no better example on that than Oklahoma State, T. Boone Pickens Stadium. Incredibly intimidating. They're slapping the paddles. They're literally right behind those guys. Same thing in Iowa, right behind them. Uh, Virginia Tech, it's like that as well. That's Those kind of advantages also help in architecture as well when we're talking about that. The second factor is location. Ben Hill Griffin Stadium, University of Florida, called the Swamp, named after Ben Hill Griffin, who was a politician, just like uh, Beaver Stadium, named after a, a politician, not a beaver. I think he was the governor. I don't know. Maybe we got a Penn Stater list in. Anyway, the Swamp is a very fun nickname. That area is disgusting. <laughs> it's so gross down there. That sometimes it feels like you could poke the air and like a raindrop would fall out. And usually nicknames come about organically. That one did not. That was self-glossed by Steve Spurrier, who in 1992 just decided to start calling it the Swamp. Quote, we're going to call our home the Swamp. What do you think? Swamp Gators. Where the Swamp Gators live. We feel comfortable in there, but we want our opponents to feel tentative swampy and hot and sticky it can be dangerous we feel that's an appropriate nickname for our stadium so spurrier nicknamed it the swamp and uh that's that's a pretty legendary story how about wyoming seven thousand feet above the sea windy is all get out that's a stadium in a location that is going to affect the game and again a place that has the architecture and the remote location Watson stadium in oregon incredibly remote And all these old dog Big Ten teams are going to have a rough time traveling out there. 
we're going to have a rough time traveling out there playing Oregon. Can you imagine the likes of the Illinois and Indianas of the world? Here's my top three. And one of them doesn't have anything to do with any of my criteria. Number three, Texas A&M. Absolutely. It's one of just a few 100,000-seat stadiums where you have a fan base with a chip on its shoulder. They've never won much of anything. So you got the architecture because it's massive, ton of people, pretty well straight up. They got a chip on their shoulder. They're in the Texas heat. When you look at the other 100,000-seat stadiums, look at how much success they've had. Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, Texas, Tennessee. Penn State, Tiger Stadium, Texas A&M. Like one of these things is not like the other, and it's Texas A&M. It's absolutely an incredibly tough place to play. Number two, Austin Stadium. You got the architecture, the way it's shaped. You got the fan base with a big chip on its shoulder. Maybe never been bigger now, right? They're just now right at the top of their game, trying to break through, and all they're hearing from everybody is, yeah, you're good, yeah, you're good. You've never won anything. Man, I can't wait for that game. And number one, how boring is this? I know, but it's LSU, of course. It's in my intro, right? They're just different. There is something so strange about that little pocket of the country and those folks down there. There's nothing really about the architecture other than it seats a lot of people that makes that crazy. It's nothing about really having a chip on their shoulder. They've won a whole heck of a lot. They are a top 15 program in the history of college football. But man, a night game in LSU they have now taken so much pride because they've gotten so much publicity from it nationally and so much, you know, uh, credit about it and, and people wanting to make, like, put it on their bucket list to go see a night game at LSU that they've even ramped it up more from how it originally started. And uh, it's just bananas. It's absolutely bananas. So those are my top three. And I think that you can get – you what do you – Three points, right? You get a three-point home field advantage. There are some places that I think can get you a little bit more than that three points. And I definitely think Austin is one of them. I definitely think Tiger Stadium at night is one of them. And, and they play a lot more night games than most stadiums. And I definitely think Texas A&M is one of them as well. Even though Texas A&M barely has an over 500 record in the SEC since they joined at home. Uh, again, if you put Ohio State in that stadium, I think that that home field advantage would be better for Ohio State than Ohio Stadium is. And when we talk about our stadium, you know, we got people that are very irritated with the environment at our stadium. They want it to be better. They want the same thing in Alabama. Nick Saban used to rail on it all the time. People leaving early, people not being loud enough. It's the same kind of stuff we go through. Ohio Stadium is the most gorgeous cathedral in all of football. It's something special that we're lucky to have. I don't care how few bathrooms there are, how poor the concessions may be, how if you are sitting at places in B-deck, you can't see part of the field or the arc of a punt. That is frustrating. It really is. But none of that matters. It's something that is so unique to college football. It's absolutely gorgeous. The atmosphere in Ohio Stadium would be absolutely insane if we won at the clip Wisconsin did. We don't. You, over time, become, we've never been bad. You have expectations that are very, very high, uh, very tough to meet. If you're playing a subpar team and you're not beating the heck out of them, there is a certain irritation in the fan base. We've all felt it when we, you know, just think of all the times you've watched the Buckeyes play down to their opponent in the third quarter against an Indiana or a Maryland at home. 
and you're just irritated. We, we, we could be winning by 14 and you're still irritated because we're, we should be beating them by 35. We have every advantage in the world uh, from coaching to fan support, to uh, financial support to players. You, you need to be beating these guys by more than that. That's just the way we feel about things. But even when we are beating them as bad as we should, it still doesn't feel great. I mean, we, we cheer when we do good, but in between the big plays, it's still a very subdued atmosphere. It's just, uh, it's just the thing you deal with when you have success in a very usually lackluster home schedule, which is what you always hear me rail about. I want to play tougher teams throughout the year. I want to play a better schedule. And I was asked a question to rank the rivalries in the comments, rank all of Ohio State's rivalries. And I sat down and started putzing about with it. And I went a different direction with it. So. I was going to do the best out-of-conference rivalries. And when I say rivalries, I mean not really rivalries, right? We have one rival. But the best out-of-conference rivalries or series we like to play, it's the teams we hate that we want to play more of. Um, I was going to do the all-time records. And then the, the Big Ten ones. And it just kind of swung. And I eventually decided I wanted to do this. I wanted to make my perfect schedule. So my perfect schedule, which contains three out-of-conference games, obviously, to, to start the season, then the nine Big Ten games, the Big Ten championship, and then now the four playoff games. I intentionally – we had to – I'm sorry, guys. We had to lose the Big Ten championship just so that we could get the home championship game and we could play that one more additional opponent. So that's what we did in my dream schedule for 2024. So this is our schedule. Okay, so for the dream schedule, season of 2024, season of dreams, dream schedule, we are starting the season in a night game down at LSU. That's right. Our all-time record against LSU is 1-1-1, one, one, and, one, and we're going to start the season down there, returning the favor of a, of a home-and-home. Home. We played them last year in this hypothetical scenario. We're heading back down there. It's going to be one of the most beautiful uniform matchups all year. Why would we start off with such a tough game in our dream schedule? Well, because it's so difficult. We're going to go challenge ourselves. We're going to play an amazing game and find off right find out right off the rip are we dogs? Do we have flaws that we need to fix? There's two ways to get in the playoff. An at large bid and we've already established that if we took the playoff system and went back to the beginning of the BCS, 53% of those seasons, there will be a three-loss team. And if you go take your shot at a big game and play good and lose, odds are you're going to be that team that gets the nod. 27% of the time, multiple three-loss teams are in. And in that case, if you go take your shot at a big game on the road and you lose and play good, you're definitely going to get that. Because you got stones and you're going to get rewarded for that because everybody wants to see those games, more of them, not less of them. To do that, you got to make sure you reward those teams. And we're going to start seeing that more and more. Game number two, we're going to head back home after we go down and beat LSU in Baton Rouge. And we're going to play a very easy opponent, right? You got to have a cream puff. You guys are making me have a cream puff. We've argued about this enough. I understand you need the cream puff. Okay but it's going to be a power four cream puff. We're not playing Mac. We're certainly not playing FCS. We're going to play the biggest cream puff in the power four. So Colorado comes in to the horseshoe and we whoop on Colorado for game two of our dream schedule of 2024. For game three, we welcome in another P4 team. It's going to be a better team in the P4, but not someone who can beat us, beat us. Maybe they would beat us one out of 10 times. Kansas State. It's a dangerous game. It's a good test. Sound, good football team. Always play good, sound football. Really hard playing dudes. They always know their assignments. They don't beat themselves. It's a heck of a challenge. And we're going to beat Kansas State for the last out-of-conference game. Then we head in to our schedule in conference. And we're going to start on the road. 
one of the stadiums that I really love in the Big Ten. We're going to head to Kinnick Stadium in Iowa City, and we're going to play those Hawkeyes. Horrible uniforms that are straight-up Steelers uniforms because Hayden, Hayden Fry asked Chuck Knoll if he could use the Steelers uniforms, and Chuck Knoll not only gave him permission, but actually sent him Steelers uniforms, and that's why Iowa wears those uniforms to this day. So we're going to go out there. I'm a Browns fan. No offense to my Steelers buddies in here. I know there's a lot of you. Of course, you know, I have to not like your uniform, right? It is, objectively speaking, it's a very good-looking uniform, all right? I'll give you that. Anyway, we go to Kinnick. We know it's dangerous, but it's a heck of a fun place to play. I love it. We're going to do the wave. It's going to be great. We're going to get the win, and we're going to come back home and face one of the first Blue Bloods on our schedule, USC. Our all-time record against USC in 23 meetings is 10, 13, and 1. We cannot allow them to continue to have this winning record against us. We won't for long. All we need to do is win four in a row against them, and we take it. Now, the reason we're having this one at home is because we have no interest in traveling out to that crap stadium that they play at out there. It's horrible. It's hideous. Nobody's ever there unless we're there. They would all be there then. But we're going to win this game, of course. And then we're heading out to Penn State for game six for a whiteout at night. Our all-time record against Penn State, 24-14. and 14. For the younger audience, there's not that many because Penn State used to be an independent like Notre Dame for a long time. And when they joined the Big Ten, people around here were not very happy because they weren't technically in the Midwest. That was a thing. And now we've got uh, Oregon and Rutgers in the Big Ten. Funny how that worked out, right? Anyway, we're going to win that one, of course. And then a final tune-up against one of my favorite Big Ten opponents. Though I prefer to play this one in their stadium. We're going to have to put off Camp Randall, Randall for another year because we got to have another home game. So the Badgers and Luke Fickle come in. The all-time series against the Badgers. Take a guess, man. We've played 86 games against Wisconsin. How many do you think we've won out of 86? 63. 63, 18, and 5 is our record against Wisconsin, which, gosh, man, I would have thought that Wisconsin had done a little better in that series. But they sucked. They sucked for a very, very long time. And uh, it's still one of my favorite Big Ten games. I always enjoy playing Wisconsin. Always a tough game. I love it. Um, I like it at both stadiums. We've had some doozies over the years in my life. All right, the next game we're heading out to, in my opinion, maybe the toughest stadium in the country. All right, the next game we're heading out to, in my opinion, one of the three toughest stadiums to play in in the entire country. We're heading out to Eugene, Oregon. The whole country is going to be watching just like they will be August 12th. August 12th. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> October 12th to take on those pesky Oregon Webfoots. The Webfoots. All right. The next game, we're heading out to the second toughest place to play in the entire country. Out to Eugene, Oregon, like we will be October 12th, to take on the Oregon Webfoots. I'm not making that up. They were actually called the Webfoots until the year before I was born. They wanted to sound tougher, so they changed it to the Ducks. I love sports teams that are named, and the name has something that means something to the area like the Ohio State Buckeyes or the San Francisco 49ers, Oklahoma Sooners. I, I think that's so cool. And there's a ton of them in college football. The SEC is the most unoriginal. Like the SEC names for their teams are so weak. Like it sounds like if you had a bunch of kids and you were like, pick a name for your football team, make it something tough. And LSU 
was like, I want the Tigers. And then Auburn was like, no, I'm Tigers. Mississippi State was like, I want the Bulldogs. Georgia was like, no, I'm Bulldogs. And Missouri said, I'm Tigers too. And then Auburn was like, well, I like Tigers and Eagles. Florida said, alligators can eat them all. Alabama said, we like elephants. War Eagle. And then Arkansas said, we like pigs. All right, so next game, we're coming home, UCLA. And this is going to be a color-on-color matchup because you know your boy loves UCLA's uniforms. One of the most beautiful uniforms in the world in any sport. So UCLA, Ohio State, in a color-on-color matchup. And that's going to be one of our two color-on-color matchups this year. Then we get our second of our eight historical Blue Bloods as we travel out to Memorial Stadium in Nebraska. Always a wonderful trip. Beautiful part of the country. Great folks. Great stadium. And a win. Then we come back home for the game. The game will also be a color-on-color game, which the Buckeyes and the Wolverines have not done since like 1954. So we beat that team, go to the Big Ten Championship, where we face Wisconsin. Now, this was my dream schedule. I have to find a way to lose this game so that we can play that home playoff game. The reason I chose Wisconsin is because it's the least offensive team to lose to because Fickle's their coach, right? I couldn't make it Purdue. I couldn't make it Indiana. It just would be too unbelievable. So we lose to Purdue in the Big Ten Championship. We're not Big Ten champs, but of course we get the at-large bid. We're the fifth seed in the playoffs, which means we would normally play the 12th seed G5 team, but this year we can't because what happened was Akron won the MAC. They were undefeated. But the first game of the year in their out-of-conference game, they had gone down to Alabama and beat Alabama, which means Alabama couldn't be ranked ahead of them. So Alabama is the 12th seed. The Zips are the 11th seed. So instead of playing Alabama, we've got to, instead of playing Akron, we have to welcome in Alabama for the first round at home. It's snowing for the game, by the way. Enter the Tide. Five total games in the series between Ohio State and Alabama. Alabama has won. Four of those five games, if you believe that crap. We beat Alabama, of course, and we advance on. Next next game, we meet Texas. Texas, our record against, one and two. We're going to level this up, of course, and beat Texas and beat the kid starting for Texas that should have been starting for us. Of course, if he was starting for us, Quinn Ewers would have already been the first pick in the NFL draft. But he's gone, so he's starting for them. We beat them and send him packing with cocky Steve Sarkeesian. We just call him cocky Steve, man. Cocky Steve takes one on the chin. Now, final four, a bit of a new rival as we get another shot at Clemson and their weirdos. And this time, no officiating call is going to cost us the game. And we win again like we did last time. And then we get a rematch of the 2022 National Championship game against Georgia, only this time, no weird officiating call is going to cost us the game. And we win again, like we actually won last time, just didn't win on the scoreboard. And that's the season of dreams. What do you think? First team to ever win 16 games, by the way. Buckeyes. National champs. No matter how you splice it, whether you just, whatever figures you want to use to gauge who is the greatest program of all time. How do we rate the best college football programs ever? How do we judge? It's so difficult because college football is a sport with such a long history. It was so regional for a very long time. Uh, Some schools started earlier than others, got good, better than others. So many different uh, voting bodies voted for things like national championships. So many schools have a a crazy number of national championships that are claimed and and some are disputed. So it's tough. So I came up with what I feel are the 11 best criteria to judge the dominance, relevance, and success of a college football program. And those 11 categories are total wins all time total winning percentage all time national championships playoff appearances consensus all americans 
number of weeks in the AP poll, number of weeks at number one in the AP poll, all-time draft picks, all-time first-round draft picks, and Heisman trophies. Um, these are the categories that I've chosen that I feel are the most relevant. Now, you could have some that you think are more relevant or less relevant. You could have some that uh, you think don't belong in there and want to add one. And I've played around with the numbers that way too. And uh, it pretty much doesn't matter how you splice it. They, they usually always come back in the same order of eight. In the top eight programs, no matter how you use these numbers or what extra categories you add in, are always going to be the same eight programs. And that is the eight historical blue bloods. Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, USC, Oklahoma, Texas, Nebraska. Those eight programs have separated themselves quite a bit from the rest of college football. That's why they're the Blue Bloods, and that's why they'll remain the Blue Bloods. And even a school like Nebraska, who's been down for 20 years, is still there. So what I did was I went through each category, and I assigned a rank for each school in that category. For instance, if we're talking national championship category, Alabama has the most national championships. They get a one next to their name. So the goal is you want the lowest total points at the end when you tally it up. You want a one next to your name in each category. And the results were pretty stunning to me. Not for one team. But let's go through it. I'll just read to you. Let's just pick one school and go through the categories. So let's go USC. And these are their ranks, right? So wins, eighth. Winning percentage, eighth. Ten win seasons, six. National championships, fourth. Playoffs, tied 16th. All-Americans, fifth. Weeks in the top 25, sixth. Weeks at number one, fifth. Draft picks, second. First rounders, second. Heismans, first. For a total of 63 points. And USC finishes sixth. So that's kind of how we did it. Go through, rank them each in each category, and then add up the total at the end. Our number one school got 27 points. Out of 11 categories, they had only 27 points. That's amazing. Um, our weakest school of the eight historical Blue Bloods was 125th. Now, I also added in Georgia and Tennessee who finished ninth and 10th into this. So if we're ranking the top 10, Georgia would be ninth, Tennessee would be 10th. And our top eight of the Blue Bloods, ranking the Blue Bloods in this way, goes. Number eight, Texas. Number seven, Nebraska. Number six, USC. Number five, Oklahoma. Number four, Notre Dame. Number three, Michigan. Number two, Alabama. And number one, with just 27 total points, the Ohio State University, and we'll go through their numbers. Wins, third. Winning percentage, first. Ten win seasons, fourth. National championships, fifth. Playoff appearances, third. Consensus All-Americans, second. Weeks in the top 25, first. Weeks at number one, second. Draft picks, third. First rounders, first. Heismans, tied second. Now, I went ahead and adjusted this because obviously you could have an outlier, right? You could have one where you're really good at, one category, one where you're really bad at. So what you just heard was the total, and I wanted to make sure that everything stayed the same if I threw out the best and the worst category, the best and the worst score for each school. So I did that, and it came out in the exact same order. So... We did it uh, standard, we did it adjusted, same exact order. Number one program, Ohio State, edges out Bama, 27 to 31. After that, you got a gap, then it goes down to Michigan and Notre Dame, who kind of ride together, 42 and 46, then Oklahoma right behind them at 48, then a big gap down to USC at 63, a bigger gap down to Nebraska at 98, and after Nebraska at 98, you go all the way down to 125 to get to Texas, which uh, my premise and the reason I started this was Texas, I believe, 
is way overrated uh, as far as the Blue Bloods and one of the weaker Blue Bloods that there is. And this confirms not only are they one of the weaker Blue Bloods that there is, they're the weakest Blue Blood that there is even behind Nebraska by a considerable margin after 20 years of Nebraska being total garbage. Um, the second reason I started this was I thought Ohio State was undervalued by the general public and they did not get their proper due. And as we can see, they're number one. But no matter what you, you, there is no, you cannot honestly use any kind of data that would leave out the Ohio State Buckeyes out of at least the top one, two, or three spot. I don't think we get the respect like that nationally from people who are just average folks. People in the know know, but not average folks. But that doesn't matter here. That's not what I'm talking about today. I've whined about that enough. What I'm talking about today is the uncomfortable truth, and that is our all-time record against so many teams from the South is a losing record, and it's just infuriating to me. It really is. We talked about the losing record to USC. Um, we're going to have the opportunity to tie that one up soon. Four matchups, four straight, bada bing, bada boom. Tennessee, Alabama, Texas, Auburn, Georgia, South Carolina, Clemson, Florida State, Florida, Texas. We have losing records against every single one of them. It drives me insane. Programs we have winning records over, big-time programs, Notre Dame, Nebraska, Penn State. About the only Southern teams are Texas A&M and Miami. But the good news is this playoff is going to give us the opportunity to play a lot more of these teams and get it back. Texas, we're only down one game. We could get that done this year. Only down one against Auburn, one against Tennessee. Alabama, we got a couple. We got to get a couple back from them. Clemson, one and four, same as Alabama. We need some more matchups with them too. So, you know, another one of these reasons that I am finding a silver lining for this playoff because I cannot stand, but by the time my life's over, I want these losing records rectified. At least half of those, I want to be winning records against these jerks from the South that will never let us stop hearing about it. All right, so today, if you're catching this and it's not yet 11.30, we're going to go live at 11.40. And we're going to go live at 11.40, and we're going to watch Trajan Odom's announcement at noon. Um, not going to do a show, just pulling this up to hang out. And uh, I hope to see you guys there. So. Please join me at 1140. We'll talk. If you have any questions or you want to talk about anything, um, we'll talk about whatever you guys want to while we're waiting, uh, both before and after Trey Genotem's announcement. Trey Genotem is a big time get. This is a huge prospect that has kind of flown under the radar. And uh, I think we got a really good shot at him. So join me at 1140 and I will see you guys then. Chuck on Bucks out.